I have a rule when I design, never solve the problem that I'm asked to solve. Why? Because almost always it's the symptom. And I don't want to solve the symptom, I want to solve the deep, fundamental, underlying issue. I practice human-centered design, which means I have to understand the people I'm designing for. So the second thing I have to do is go find the people I'm designing for, and I go and watch them. If you ask people, what is it you need, they'll tell you their symptoms. Oh, I have a problem with this, I have a problem with that. No, I want to know the fundamental issues they're trying to solve, what their activities are, how they behave, because if I can get at the real, underlying, deep, fundamental issue, Guess what? The symptoms go away. I think at this moment, we, we really need to start imagining how we want to live, how we want to be as people together, and what do we want out of our lives. Meet the Media Guru ha funzionato come una piattaforma di raccordo che ha permesso di ritrovare le proprie eccellenze, di metterle in collegamento con il mondo attraverso questi incontri internazionali, di ragionare sulle trasformazioni in atto, di avviare quindi anche tutta una serie di idee, di soluzioni molto innovative. I don't like making predictions at all. I actually think it's a rather stupid idea. People have said you know, stuff about the, the, the future that has proven totally wrong. And, and I don't do it because I don't, I don't mind being wrong. I just don't think it makes any sense. I'm, I, I am a theorist who observes, um, and I have a sensibility for something that I see happening. Because instead of, of like pretending that the future is going to be this perfectly aseptic technological world, realize something important about technology, which is obsolescence. It's what we're living in, garbage. Uh, <laughs> technological garbage, but also accelerated decrepitude, we call it. I mean, it's a fantastic notion, accelerated decrepitude. It's exactly what our computer do, what our bodies are doing, this kind of speeding up. But what's really different about the future is it's all about what you want to become. You have to put yourself out of where you are and you have to project yourself to where you want to be. Volevo proprio creare un evento che non fosse semplicemente un, un evento di ascolto, ma che fosse veramente un evento di tipo partecipativo. I really believe that the future is about teams of people working together to better our lives and to reimagine how we live. So how, as a designer, do you shift from designing on behalf of people, thinking about their best interests, to actually creating a system that lets them design for themselves and that gives them the tools and enables them to generate the world that they want around them.
Bene, un applauso intanto a voi, saluto il pubblico per questo decennale di Mide Media Guru edizione speciale Future Ways of Living sono veramente felice di vedervi perché sarà una maratona di due giorni per provare insieme, tutti insieme a disegnare il futuro che io quando sono arrivata qui Aldo mi ricordo la prima volta che sono entrata qui dieci anni fa, undici forse ho guardato questo spazio nell'insieme presente, passato e futuro e ho detto, beh, i templari della cultura digitale devono incontrarsi in questo posto. Però io qui adesso Luigi, gli ho tolto la parola su questo. Maria, grazie, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you all here today. I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the physical world and how we think about the physical world is going to have to change because of the digital world and how we need a new kind of evolutionary design thinking and collaborative design practice to make that happen. I happen to run um, an interdisciplinary design think tank uh, at George Brown College called the Institute Without Boundaries. We founded it uh, 12 years ago and have been working with people from all sorts of disciplines from all sorts of countries around the world, with students and faculty and professionals, thinking up uh, new ways of living, new ways of uh, addressing the global problems that we're all facing. I'm Robert Giusti. I, am, I was one of the leads on helping to develop the Future Ways of Living charrette. So a charrette, I think it has kind of a, a standard definition. A charrette is when there's multiple people that come together to kind of drive and co-create. It's a structured brainstorming process based on a collective understanding. So you need a group of, you know, experts, professionals, creative thinkers, designers. It doesn't really matter where they come from. The diversity in this one was pretty broad. So we had participants from almost every major continent around the world, now that I'm looking at this map. The goal was to have the lectures feed into their work and the lectures were more of like inspirational ideas around, you know, here's my vision for what I think the future looks like from my perspective, from my discipline, and here are some projects that showcase what that looks like. Really fundamentally to me, what I've understood over the years is that it's through sharing that we gain wisdom. My grandparents used to share with me i proverbi italiani and it was through those proverbi that I learned wisdom. I think it's in communicating with each other around the world today, whether it be through social media, that we're able to share with each other and gain new wisdom. In that sense, design is a way that we make things that allow us to share the world and understand the world together. And if you think about it, we're in this room, which is a building, and I'm holding a product, which is a microphone, and it's through design that I'm able to share my ideas with you today. Perché noi siamo qui, Future Ways of Living, per tracciare insieme le rotte dei prossimi dieci anni. Grazie, grazie tanto. Grazie. Eh, veramente grazie. Andiamo avanti perché se ne è can de più. <ride>
over the next 10 years. So in 2025, in Milano and Toronto. You know, here we really tried to explore, you know, that design strategy within day one. And then day two is about design development. Day three is about fleshing out those ideas and presenting them to the rest of the team in order to get feedback. Day four, then you revisit based on the feedback that you get to then further enhance those ideas and refine them. And then day five is really about, you know, packaging and publishing and really kind of honing in and designing those solutions so that they make sense to the general public. But being able to start with that framework then creates kind of this barrier for your thinking that allows you to really narrow and focus in on whatever you're designing for. It was funny because yesterday I asked everybody, what would, do you, if I could tell you what your life would be like in 10 years, would you want to know it? And everybody in the group said, no, I don't want to know it. I go, okay, so that's super ironic because now we're going to tell people what their life's going to be in 10 years, but nobody at this group wants to know what their life is. So, and I think it's, it, it, 10 years is funny enough where it's, it's kind of like not so far away. The first day is really kind of a brain dump. Nice to meet everybody. Um, before we dive into our topic, are there any questions about the shred process? Maybe we can start with some of the research that's already begun and we can go from there. Yeah, sure. Let's start by you talking to me about what you have. Forget about the brief right now. Just talk to you about what have you guys been thinking about? So what did you find out? Well, <laughs> a lot is happening in food, of course. Yeah, it's just probably the most complicated thing yes. in the world. And because it affects other kinds of... Uh, the system is, is kind of... Yeah. And we just have to decide, I think, because it's really a big topic, decide where we want to head. There's the problem of, because your job changes, and keeps changing, and it's not the same job because that society it's changes not the faster. Same <laughs> and you're not the same person anymore. Uh, you need to keep going to school. So you come in day one. <laughs> what do you do? You know, I think the first thing that you do really is you sit down with your team, you get to know each other, you understand where everybody's coming from, what their discipline is, what their area of specialties is, and really what they're interested in. Because I think that what people's interests are really influences this design process. It's, it's using those design levers, the who, what, when, where, why, and how. But I think also during that ideation session, it's really about, you know, really delving deep into some research to really understand, you know, A, why you're designing it. We have this food system that exists now, and it's like, okay, we need to intervene in it. But it's like, do you want to intervene in that system? Because like, maybe that system's shit. So you just say, you know? No, so you take another approach to the research as opposed to the thing of, oh, we really want to understand the system. So. Um, people use design by community as a kind of... <laughs> uh, to, to pick one channel to focus on, I think it's interesting, but the problem is, is that once you focus on one, you, it's almost like you need to do it like a layer. Like if distribution is the first thing, then behind the layers, you have to show how the other five fit in, or else you're completely yeah. um, stuck. Design by committee is, for me, design by committee is one person goes away and does something, and then a bunch of people add on to it or take away things. This is not design by committee in my definition because we're working together from the start to develop the design together. So it's, it doesn't become designed by committee, it becomes whether a group succeeded in designing together or not designing together. Does that make sense, like the, the difference? What I don't want to do is create something that's very safe uh, and that like, I don't necessarily want to say that we're, I don't want to use these five days to necessarily solve, solve a specific thing. Mm -hmm. I would like to do it to create more questions about the things that we're trying to solve. So I don't know if you've ever seen this diagram, but it's like this squiggly line diagram that's just like, you know, this chaos in the ideation phase. And as you move towards a, to the end of the design phase, it kind of levels out into this kind of flat line. And I think that that's one of the challenges with that ideation phase is that it's, it's, it's all over the place. You're trying to explore every possible idea and every possible avenue to come up with, you know, a very refined concept. And to get a group to agree on that concept sometimes presents challenges as well. But the system is not set up 
for people who need to keep learning, right? Yeah. Learning needs to be learning and education needs to be a lot more responsive now. Yeah, yeah. Like you need to be able to respond to your changing needs as you grow and develop and you need to be able to, I mean, we can learn, we can get information quickly. So right? it has to move from being standardized to being customized yeah. Yeah. and it has to move from being only a part of your life yeah. to all your life. Yeah. What other characteristics or qualities does the current system not have that it needs to have? Mm -hmm. so, and also 10 years is not a lot of time. No, this is the other thing too. If we so, that yeah, so that's kind of like where I'm sitting with this. So who would like to go next? Okay, this is us now. This is uh, the 20, we are now 2015. And this is uh, 2025. Sadly speaking, it's, the future seems like it's going to really get it back, worse and worse. I, I'm not a pessimistic person. I, actually, I'm very realistic. Okay? And if we look at what, where we've been 20 years ago and where we are now, yeah, we're more advanced in technology. Ah, but as human beings, we're getting worse and worse. What I don't like what people say about the future is that we want to make it better because it's all about talking. If you have a better future, you should have a better present. Oh. Or you can't predict it. When all the people are talking about augmented reality and touch screens and blah, 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 this is the typical way of us looking at the future. We forget all the human aspects of it. And I think that's sad. Well, would you like to, to design for the future so it's negative and uh, I try to make uh, not solutions, but I try to change mindsets. At least you can inspire people, right? I mean, you can go to a classroom and uh, you see these, you know, if you look at students say, what do you want to be in the future? And they tell you, great, I want to be a good uh, professor. But it's the first thing people say, I want to be a good teacher when you're like this small. Yeah. Maybe it's the only thing in your vision that you can change about the future is people. Maybe. Maybe. E nella città questo c'è, l'unica cosa che io vedo immobile, almeno in Italia, è la scuola. Ma dal punto di vista proprio fisico, le classi in Italia hanno ancora i banchi e la cattedra. Gli edifici sono quelli dell'Ottocento, anche se sono nuovi, la concezione dell'education è ancora quella del docente che parla e quindi broadcast se vuoi, no? All the way from the ministry down to the primary school, you've got a bunch of, you know, old fogies who don't have the first clue of what's going on running the show. They don't know the culture. The kids do, but then the kids have to still follow the patterns that they have been imposed by the standard system. In my early education, it was more about the content that we were studying. It had really no relevance to um, what we were going to do once we got out of school. It had no relevance to being global citizens. It had no relevance to being socially responsible. It had nothing to do with what is actually going on. As kids, you know, we have this imagination and creativity which I think sort of gets lost as you get older. And I think that's what I'm trying to bring back. So if there is a way, the Sharad seemed like a way to discuss this and, you know, maybe we can have some innovative ideas to change the content, change the system, so that people are more attracted to this. Other rule in pedagogy would be drop it, that whole exam system, which is of utter stupidity. Get your kids to learn how to write a good question. That's totally different from the approach that we have. The basics of what it is to be a teacher and a student and how you actually make that student become a person that comes from the pedagogy based on the alphabet and the printing press. What happens when you, instead of using just the alphabet and the printing press, you are now using screens and zero one, the digital. What would kids do? Write a novel? No, create an app. You know, <laughs> that's, that's, why wouldn't they? How can we design better education systems in order to facilitate We're doing that right now in our project. So you'll have to wait till Friday to find out. 
to me, one of the biggest one, it's so separated from work. Yes. So you're studying something yeah. and you have no idea how to use it, right? Yeah. So you're learning math, but you don't know how you might use math in life, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this division between the school and the working and creates, the world, actually. and in the world, yeah. and the real world, and they, in fact, they even say it, as you're going to graduate and go into the real world, yeah. as if the school is the fake world. Always the challenge is, is to make sure that everybody, everybody participates in a way that's meaningful for themselves because it's not nice. It's like if you just want to make a project by yourself, just go make a project by yourself. Like it's not like, oh, I, uh, you're leading the team, so it's you're leading the idea. That's not, that's not the way it works. Okay, so what is it that we're doing? Okay, so this is what I think we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> to do through, to make it what? Through, to create more opportunities of access and freedom to its users. Who are its users? Everybody. No, we can't say everybody. Arriving at Osgood, Osgood Station. The second day, the iteration phase, really was about kind of pushing the envelope of these ideas and developing iterations of what that looked like. You know, A, how can you develop a business plan? What does it look like in Milano? What does it look like in Toronto? So I, I think that it's really about kind of understanding the details of a project and then continually iterating to improve upon and improve upon until you get to an idea or, a, or kind of a complete set of ideas that then make up an actual project. So living in one city and working in another. What other? Um... Or not moving at all. Or not moving at all. Um, what kind of? Let me flush out a couple more ideas, maybe in the next five minutes, and then start working on that general user. Pensamos en un producto en su totalidad, desde el inicio con el usuario, trabajamos con el usuario en un contexto. Luego pensamos una problemática en ese contexto y que el usuario tiene y diseñamos para esa persona. We just said, okay, what is wellness? What does wellness mean? Wellness is necessary for everyone to be a productive human being in society at any age. People ask me, oh, what do you like about Mexico? What do you miss from Mexico? I'm like, you know what? The people are friendlier, they're warmer. They just they open you, the doors to you, like they just. I'm not so reserved as my experience in other countries. We realized that actually health was fundamental to all of them because no one really is going to care what kind of transportation system they have if they don't have fundamental health. Okay, the first thing should be safety. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, how much time do we spend like traveling around one place to another? That is time like in the general day, this guy can be with his family. I remember when I was like in Lima and I was supposed to go to work, I was arriving at work stressed. It was nine o'clock in the morning, I was already stressed just because of traffic jam, that I was like thinking that I was not going to be on time. And to spend two hours in a bus in the morning and two hours back home, it's a lot of time. It's like four hours of your day that you can be doing something else. So there's so everything is ready for time actually. Yeah, so everything is time. So yeah, so time is sorry, you need ball means efficiency. Well my country, well Lima is still missing some mobility like real regulations. We are, right now Lima is working on this. We are in a transition. We are having we are passing from no uh, public transportation to public transportation. Italia está en el segundo puesto de, de ranking de la salud y en Uruguay está en el 65. O sea, he visto muchas cosas interesantes para, para llevarme y poder mostrar en mi escuela cuán interesante es salir y conocer, sobre todo la parte de diseño y de diseñar y pensar nuevas formas. En Uruguay no está muy desarrollada esa parte. Considero que necesitamos pensar en desde que se nace hasta que se jubila una persona. Diseñar un sistema o una organización para todos. I mean, it's not to give up the design part. It's just like to make it real, to make it visible. 
So it's how you balance the, these crazy ideas that you have as a designer, but how do you make it possible? How do we get this done? Great ideas, but how do we make it happen? This charrette, it was part of a process where we were inspired by these world leaders. They had exposed us to the latest thinking and they had challenged our current beliefs on just any kind of systems design you could think of. As human beings, you know, we, we make things, we make tools, we make technologies to address the problems that we have. And in doing so, um, we either reveal or create new problems. And that principle is very evident in the, in the field where I work, which is healthcare, in the emergence of chronic non-communicable diseases as the primary issue that we have to deal with things like heart disease or diabetes or asthma, most mental illnesses. Most cancers today, in fact, have this characteristic. We can't fix them, we can't make them go away, but we can live with them successfully for many years, for many decades. You have a system which is designed to fix people up and send them home and does a very, very good job of doing that. Whereas, you know, chronic disease is not effectively addressed by the healthcare system today. It's improvised and it's often improvised very badly. So, so people and families who are highly resourceful and who look for their own solutions and who are well connected socially and have a good social support network do okay, but a lot of people fall through the cracks. The biggest one from my perspective should be that it should be proactive, not reactive. There's no reason why I have to get sick before I get to see my doctor. A doctor should have my complete clinical record every day of my life. So what we're, the problem we're facing, in my opinion, today is a doctor gets to see me and gets to see how I'm doing every time I visit <clears throat> their office. But the question is what happens in between doctor's visits? So you can't just have this narrow image of a person. We need, we need to get to the point where we have complete clinical information. When I design a healthcare system, there's nothing to look at except the efficient use of the medical people and that it feels better for everyone. It feels better to work there and it feels better to be a patient and for that matter, for the patient's family. But there's nothing to see except that result because it's all hidden in the procedures that we have developed. And it requires a different kind of training. In healthcare, that's particularly complex because you're often dealing with this multi-stakeholder environment. So something is good only if it is perceived as good both by patients and family caregivers and physicians and nurses and healthcare administrators. So the, the, the tremendous challenge in healthcare solutions is passing all of those barriers because if you only fulfill the needs of one of those stakeholders and not the others, you'll never gain traction and scalability in a solution. Our subject was hard, like energy and work. Okay, relates to everything, but it's very abstract. What will work be in 2025? Okay. Well, like a summary, this plus, this plus, this plus. So this. yeah, so because, get, so who, who, who will be the workers in 2005? Yes. How will they work? How they will work, why they will work, where, when, so all this all together. Okay, the time, what? So this like what, uh, what, what like... Work okay, in generally. Yeah. Okay. It was a big group. Sometimes it's good because you have many ideas, but you have people that don't feel comfortable, they don't want to speak. So big group is, it was a big challenge. So we're going to start by designing the system. Okay. Two, we have like a big question for us. I'm, don't, I'm not saying we must have a problem, but some issue we want to try to solve. Like well, something more specific. But how? Mm -hmm. What do they share? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't money. like that to be the... I don't know. No, I, that I want to, to know. To be only virtual. I know you're not the Who will be I'm our user? That, but Who? I'm thinking we need uh, somehow, I don't know how, but maybe we have, we need a, pla a virtual platform, something that 
works intelligently, much better than a social network. But somehow we we'll still have something personal offline. offline. offline I don't know. Yeah. And that means meeting other people, which means you have contact with other people. Okay, it's so not that you work alone. What I'm, what I'm hearing is it's a support system. Yeah. The reason why this is needed is because there's going to be so many of these people who are in the same sort of boat yeah. in this new creative economy that's emerging. So we have to develop this. Yeah, but still, I can't understand. Okay, we will have this platform where people will share ideas, but still, how will they work and where and where will they meet? Only in the internet? But we don't have a platform. Whatever you want, you can meet at McDonald's. Maybe, maybe the system will Wait. identify that you know company A, B, and C need to get together. This location is most efficient for everybody. Meet that. They meet there. Okay, yeah, but it could be any. Where? They meet wherever they want. They call each other. Oh, and they're people like, meet at McDonald's. <laughs> really? <laughs> And it's about business. Not in St. Peter. No. <laughs> no. Even so. in the town where I live, we, where I live, which is outside Milan, and it's a small town, there there is a McDonald's, and a lot of people meet there mm. to talk about come business. On. Big business, come on. I, no, no. <laughs> but I thought you guys hated McDonald's, <laughs> like, carpet. But it doesn't really matter. Maybe in 10 years, McDonald's. No, I agree with you. I'm just. Making fun. Yeah, I know. I know. It's super funny. Consider that Italy is not a country so ahead in the technology, new technology adoption. Our country is made of SMEs, most of all. We have a very few big companies. These small SMEs are concentrated in sectors that are called traditionally traditional sectors, uh, so fashion, for example, design, machinery. They are eager to innovate and they are very competitive between each other, but they don't see the importance of adopting new technologies, for example, digital technologies. Il tema del digitale non è mai stato veramente una delle priorità in Italia. Era proprio considerato qualcosa sì che verrà, però intanto l'economia continuava ad andare avanti come prima, non ci si preparava con le professionalità nuove, la scuola al massimo aveva qualche computer ma niente di più come attenzione a tutto questo cambiamento di linguaggio, la creatività eccetera. È stato un paese frenato su questo, molto frenato. L'aspetto internazionale è fondamentale, mi confronto con il mondo e vado più veloce a capire dove devo andare e come posso andare, no? There's a lot of data and a lot of people and these things are like coming out of PCs and coming out of laptops, it's like expanding. Yeah. So the physical possibilities that the computers are providing us are not enough. So that's why we, are, we start to use our own environment to store some data. So for example, if, if I enter a room and if I know that on the left wall I see some candidates, but on the right wall I see more refined results and maybe on the other wall I see like three possibilities who are matching me. And every, every time I enter this room, every day, every new day, these walls are refreshing themselves. We have to do a presentation, but we yeah. have to think about what we're going to show. But yeah. this presentation, so we have to make it uh, digital? Yeah. Yes, or we have, to yes we have to make everything digital. Yeah. Should this Internet of Things text move over here because it refers more to these? Internet of Things, I know, it's its own funny little thing, isn't it? I can it delete this one and put the text here. And I, I delete this, or I can keep because here I will put the name in so you can... Um, oh yeah, because the, the name will go there. Okay, so you highlighted the ones that were the most important. So let yes, me just think about this for a second. The presentation day was, it's, it's always difficult to synthesize ideas where we kind of present ideas fully at day three and then continue to develop for another two days. So the challenge is that you know you have another two days of charrette that you need to get through. You only had two days thus far to develop ideas 
and you need to pre present them very concisely within a 10 minute presentation and convince people that your idea is valid, good, and, you know, innovative in some way and is representing kind of this future scenario that you would want to live in. You get all of these ideas and all of these great conversations that are happening, but how do you actually kind of synthesize that into this, this short presentation that you need to, to do? Also serves to communicate, um, sorry, not only human resources, but also other resources. So it's an inventory. It's an online inventory of people and it's an online inventory of um, devices. So it's people talking to people, people talking to objects, and objects talking to objects. So I, I think that one of the key flaws, and I, I think that this was something that we saw kind of right after the first presentation, I think is the idea that we also had this assumption that this would then collect all of this data. And I think that this is a huge assumption. You know, we rely on all of this new technology and data all the time to kind of make decisions and augment our efficiency. And, but we have to then go back and question, you know, is it really making an improvement or is it something that we need to revisit kind of the fundamental aspects of, of how we do these things? We got to the point where we can extract all this information from people. So we know who you are, we know what you eat, uh, how much you walk, how much you sleep. Uh, perhaps we'll soon know how you feel. The real question is, who collects this data? What are they doing with it? Can it be misused? Every decision we make in life, everything about how ordinary human life is structured and executes can be supported by a computer. What I'm talking about are systems that deal with probabilities, with natural language, and they learn. They learn and they solve and they evolve. We're dealing with machines like that just now, today. There will at least be the opportunity to get a deep, quantified projection of the future. And it will be special to try and make a decision without that assistance. I know that sounds radical, but if I would have told you in the 1990s that every minute of the day, people would be commenting on what they ate, or being able to read instant Feedback. I mean, I just got tweets as I was standing here, so I wouldn't have believed that 20 years ago because we're dealing with a world that's far less of what we see and touch and much more of what we can perceive and imagine. I'm, I'm well, not strictly against uh, smartphones, but uh, I, don't, I don't really you know, like <laughs> what I see. Like People just constantly obsessed at looking at this little screen and if they're not looking at this screen, they're looking at like some, some other screen somewhere. What worries me is uh, people are becoming so dependent on technology and uh, losing this touch with, with what they're themselves able to do. Connecting actually, connecting things. You let the device do it for yourself. You don't have to really think about anything anymore. But I mean, this is like, <laughs> What worries me basically is like losing touch with humanity. As technology progresses, we're kind of taking stuff for granted and we're becoming less and less uh, independent actually as people, as human beings, and uh, more dependent on this thing we've created outside of ourselves. It sounds very dystopic and like Terminator 2 Judgment Day, and I don't mean it in like that kind of way. I mean it actually, it's, I think it's, it's more sort of uh, sneaky in a way, because it's like, uh, it's more comfortable. It's like, uh, we've created this comfort zone, this sofa, and we're like kind of sinking into it. So yes, yeah, so data, oh my God, someone's gonna steal your individual data of how many steps you make in a day and how many hours of yoga you do. Really, seriously? I don't think so. Do we want that privacy protected when it comes to health? I mean, if you have a child, that has a chronic illness, you participate in that with that child on studies for that chronic illness. Everything at some point is experimental or is being tracked. Don't I want to participate in knowing how to prevent certain illnesses when I get to be 75? I do. And if I need to disclose all my private information, be it so, I'm going to get a huge gain out of that knowledge. Will the CIA use it against me? Well, I don't think so. 
I mean, what are, what are their benefit? Big data is a system, a repository of infinite possibilities of intelligence. Infinite. Just learn how to ask the right question and the rest will come. It's tough to develop an idea that's fleshed out fully. So of course there's a lot of gaps in thinking and I think that there were still a lot of gaps in the projects at that point, but it, it was a matter of it, the teams at least acknowledged that there were gaps. Okay, so assistance? To make better decisions? No. Okay. Yeah, yeah, to pay them to help them in their decisions. To use energy in a smart way. Okay, but we have to say something like cloud-based or part that has no. Like no. We wanted to connect the intellectual energy to make a to make a network that supports the industry, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what we're still no. looking towards? The group decided yeah. to forget to create the content. Okay, so what is it? Unfortunately. So what? So what is it? Any any kind of worker and uh, some kind of system that any worker can use. Okay. We can divide this uh, individual sphere and the uh, company sphere, right? No? Italo Calvino, when he writes Palomar, tells this nice story of Mr. Palomar going to a cheese shop in Paris. And Calvino says he thinks he's at the Louvre because every cheese tells him a story of a different pasture under a different sun. We started thinking about how digital technology allows us to create new connections between people and products today. But what we were more also passionate about was the old market. We think this is much more social compared to the previous one. Here you've got people, you've got big tables with products and products bring together people. That's what we wanted to do. To really create a supermarket looks a bit like a market. Products are on tables, as you see here. Uh, on the tables, you've got Kinect. As you are familiar with the Kinect, is, uh, this system allows you to scan in 3D what is around and see where people move and how they point. And as you move with something, then products tell, tell you their story. So as you are approaching an apple or something, you know much more about it. All that information we know today about the bottle of wine, the vineyard, where it came from, all the different type of information we have online, but we don't get usually when we go and buy things. After the presentations, the idea was to come back together as a group, identify synergies between the projects that could be useful in developing them further. Day four was really a, a big struggle <laughs> for us. And one of the reasons why is because we started to question design direction after our presentation day. We saw a gap in our design development and we said, okay, we really need to focus on this to make it better, improve the project. I think we needed to debate like this. Like it needed to just like, what the fuck does everybody want to do? Like, let's start finding out. It's like, I think that if we start, if we just start getting a little bit less about being real, like being like, trying to be detailed about everything and actually start to figure out what does that world of how you eat in 2025 look like and have a little bit of fun with it. All those ideas that we had yesterday about that. We had the scenario about the future. And exactly. The and Supermarket. You could have somebody, you could have a farmer farming and you could, and then in the end, it's a scenario of what farming looks like in 2025. And we're always using Milano, I guess. We just stay in Milano, right? And a lot of the things that we learn can be in the backgrounds of the images or something like this. So essentially we just make these, like almost these images of 2025 and maybe we do like a supermarket we do a farmer yeah. we do someone in a kitchen right we yeah. do a group of people like maybe we do maybe all the things we need to do now is what are all the scenario situations that we want to do yeah. and that's it and we just work towards making those things and if someone says what are you doing it's like we're trying to create a vision of what food looks like in 2025 some majority decided okay we're not having the physical thing and let's move on with something like a system so the others, the ones that didn't agree, said, okay, let's, let's do it. 
which one were you? I did the second. Because otherwise we are not creating the Because all the people, all the groups that are amazing on a similar software based on big data. Because nobody is talking to we won't have a system. The other thing that I want to bring up is I have a very moral objection to this system being a for-profit thing. I don't think the system will work properly if it is. I think it needs to be completely neutral. Really, if we, if we allow it to be a for-profit thing, it becomes almost an oxymoron because we're devising the system to allow people to be independent and supporting small-scale companies, small-scale work and, and freelancers, but if there's this for-profit cloud hanging over everybody, it's all we're doing is creating this stuff. Corporate overlord. If I was an investor and I was looking at a financial model, that's what I would want. But I think to be um, just morally conscious, it needs to be completely neutral. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it provides assurance in cloud coverage. So, would, would yeah. that be understood that it's like global? Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. It'll provide assurance as you live rather than as you die. As you die. That's not but it's true. <laughs> They'll be there as you're living rather than when you're sick. Some of the data is now protected by companies. Pharmaceutical companies collect data on the effectiveness of their medication, and we don't have access to that data, and I think we should. I would like to know what tests were done on users when before those products were launched. All that data should be public, but it is now proprietary. So one of the things that we included in the holistic health is that companies are not allowed to sell us a product unless we understand how many people have tried it and what is the risks of that product of the data itself. We created a third party institution, which was the cloud health assurance model, where there was peer-to-peer -peer control on how the data was being stored, generated, and accessed. Right. But we really need to find a business model for that, otherwise if it's not, it's going to pay for it. It doesn't have to be so detailed, because we are projecting something, we're exploring. We're not creating something to implement next week. I think how is going to be sustainable, sus not sustainable, sustainable, feasible financially. Yeah. So we have to think if that is the, the type of information that is needed to have energy as a service. It's different kind of efficiency. I don't think that personal uh, engine uh, activities and tasks in the day is something that we would as a creative autonomous world. Yeah. So if we focus that uh, connectivity and working together and finding people is the real thing that you need to get that energy and change the world. Yeah. Interesting. Easier about this is that it's focused and it's also tangible. Like the, the big criticism for everyone was like this cloud thing is a magic system that some you know designer wrote the algorithm for that none of us understand and we're just assuming that this thing's happening. This is a tangible system that we can explain. Honestly, thank you. I needed like, I needed to bat some, I, I don't think we were, I think we were like stuck. Like, this is so complicated. Everybody's trying to figure out like small things and ways. And it's like, honestly, if you didn't come up with this idea, this would have never would have happened. So, it's so what like, are we defining now? The images? I don't know. Yeah, let's define like, where do we want? Do we want a restaurant? Do we want, like think of all the things where people are eating food. Scenarios. Yeah. yeah. Settings. settings. All settings. 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 So we're kind of creating this imaginary world, right? So yeah. we have uh, this guy, uh, this truck, <laughs> this Excuse farm, me. Uh, this supermarket. So we're kind of creating this, uh, these settings that are all yeah. one world, let's say. Everybody was like talking the same language again. I think that was good. And also, I think we're all like tired of feeling confused and tired of feeling apart and alone and exhausted. So, okay, let's be a group again and let's make it, you know. Going back to the fundamentals of why we're doing this, we've done this research yeah. in this framework for you, economy. It's, um, it's made up of autonomous freelance workers. So, knowing that, and, sorry, and, and in addition to that, there's, you know, Mass unemployment, growing unemployment, economic stress around the world. So, recognizing this emerging trend in 
um, in industry and leveraging it to support and to grow the economy of the world. And we're going to do that by allowing the creative energy that exists to connect and do good, essentially. Do better. Do good work. Kind of guided the teams toward developing content for a publication rather than just a presentation. It wasn't the idea of presenting your ideas, it was the idea of communicating them through a very clear narrative within a publication format. And after that, it was like very clear to everybody what we needed to do. We kind of divided tasks, everybody went home, worked on these tasks till probably 6 a.m. and then, you know, merged them back into our, public, our publication document. So each team kind of developed kind of this manifesto and then it was really about kind of communicating the actual physical design of those things and, and how they saw it in context. Like I was walking around, it was like almost dead silence. It was like there was less communication going on and more production happening in that day five. Which song is this? I always forget. What song is this? Mozart. Oh, it's, uh, no, it's not. I don't know who yes. it's by. Maybe, maybe. It's a collection. Mm -hmm. We need some more though. Yeah, it's prelude in C major. It's back? Mm. <laughs> no, ten, ten, ten minutes. <laughs> no, Mozart, it's this yeah. one, Mozart. Mozart. Oh, come on. Who is the boss? <laughs> the boss now. <laughs> I don't even know how to use Microsoft Word. Okay. Oh, no. One minute. No, no. Come on. We're having a little bit of a problem with internet in this room. How long do you think it's going to be, realistically? Five realistically, five, five minutes. Realistically, five minutes. Yeah, because we're having problems sending things. The, the internet's um, broken. I just want to know a realistic estimate of the Yeah, long. realistic. Yeah, thank you. If you leave now, five minutes. <laughs> Give me five. Come on, Laura. Yeah. So good. Christy! Ready? So, I'll show you. It's a one, this, and go to the next page. See, it's a... That looks really good, bro. My name's Okay. Yeah. Front and back at Prince of Large. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, va bene così. Perfetto così. Si, va benissimo. So within the screens we have all the information that is running. And this is our system. This is our team. We presented kind of our final spreads on the last day of the charrette. All of these teams worked so hard to kind of package that content and develop it into this publication format and then we took it, printed it, kind of posted it up around the room and then did a very informal presentation format where each team could kind of walk around and view the other team's publication spreads and read about their design and kind of see it in that context. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, 
so our team is mobility. And uh, so I guess what we first started to do is to chart all the different types of mobility throughout, uh, throughout time. I think one of the things that our team realized in looking at this challenge of, you know, how will we get around in the future is the fact that our transportation systems have evolved over hundreds of years and are some of the most complex urban systems that exist on the planet. There are some serious issues around how these systems are coordinated and how we utilize them. There are tons of different modalities that exist in our urban environments. So what we wanted to do was create kind of a broader solution that enabled us to think about the way that we get around and really ease that kind of transition from place to place and from system to system. We all realize that there's this inefficient use of our existing resources, so how can we tap into this kind of big data and censoring environments that are happening within cities and really make better use of these these existing resources rather than creating new ones. So what we wanted to do was create a two-tiered system of censoring that existed within the environment. One being actual environmental sensors and the second being a user sensor. What this would do is allow for this seamless transition between mobility systems, not only locally, but we envision it as kind of this global experience. The difference with this system is that, you know, I would land in Milano and just walk through the gates onto the train and it would automatically charge me for that transaction. As I get onto the train, it could direct me towards the next mode of transportation to get me from point A to point B. From our research for all those days, we understood that creative economy is going to be even more important. So how can we support creative autonomous workers? What do they need? How to make them work better and be more productive? So that's when we came up with the platform. This platform is going to make creative people work better and work together and to collaborate. Not only with other creatives, but with companies, with the government, with organizations of every kind. And to find these people, to link them, and also the platform would help them manage this project. I met very special people during the charrette but I have to travel like not very sustainable but maybe if I had a platform that somehow could make me find people and get to know them in such a deep way as I had the opportunity to do it here it would be great for my work. Our team was interested in the idea of the network society so communication through networks, not only in terms of people, but also in terms of objects. The social networks are becoming increasingly sophisticated in terms of matching people and in terms of matching people to consumer goods. So all these online connections are overwhelming and we wondered, is there a way that we could make those relationships more meaningful? So right now you can connect to some objects, but with RIFD technology and other technologies, soon every object could be connected. And what does a network of objects look like and how do they talk to each other? What happens when you combine social networks and the internet of things? What happens when you connect smart people and smart objects? We looked at how communication can facilitate work within creative industries, with clients and with resources around the world. So when you sign up for, for a platformer, you register as yourself and you register your skills and you make a profile of you and who you want to work with and the kind of jobs you're looking for. But you also have a choice of registering all the things that you own that somebody else might want to use. So it's the sharing economy um, on steroids. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. It's not just the absence of a disease or a chronic illness or infirmity. In order to live a healthy life, wellness becomes the part that we're missing. Cloud Health is an integrated health and wellness system that connects the existing public health care services and programs and the private production of health and wellness products with a new peer-to-peer assurance model that rewards all the people who are participants of the system to maintain a healthy and wellness-driven lifestyle. What we want to do, what we want to aim for, is having 100% of our human race healthy in the workforce, working to their potential. The 
synergy of health education, wellness instruction, and data collection rolling out from childbirth is essential in order to build this empowerment of the individual to make these decisions. So we wanted to escape this kind of industrial paradigm of education, which was a mass education that was delivered as a product for a specific period of our lives and then released us out into the real world to work and created a really artificial distinction between playing, learning and working. And so we wanted to play, learn and work all at the same time and we wanted to do that everywhere. You could learn from anyone. Everyone had something to teach you and it was worth it to learn from everyone. And how could we create a situation where there wasn't this specialist who was teaching you, but there was a whole society and a whole culture that was informing your growth and participating in your education. The first thing we did was reimagine how long you would learn in your life. So instead of a system which had a year long academic calendar with potentially two semesters, we granularized the system uh, so that there were month-long semesters and school could happen at any time in the year. As you can imagine, if you're working in your life, uh, you're able then to take a month off to study and learn, or you're able to take a week off to study and learn. There's this false distinction where if your course is taken in one country, it's not recognized in another country. So we would set up a global interoperability system which would recognize courses and allow you to take courses anywhere in the world and that would benchmark them against each other so that they would be in a kind of equivalence. That would allow us to actually create a diversity of options. The problem with the food system is that it's huge. The current system itself is going to fail. It always needs space. And the problem that the system is having right now and will have in the future, there will be no space for it. How will we eat in the future knowing that the current system won't be able to handle its capacity anymore? What we started to imagine was different scenarios of how we would eat, how we would shop, how our food would actually come to us. Looking at the situations you find yourself every day, but illustrating the new types of diet that you would have, not necessarily the sense of eating different things, but just looking that it would have to come from different places. In some of the scenarios, like when we look at the kitchen, for example, or we look at the grocery store, maybe we're no longer able to buy fresh meat three times a week or four, I mean, some people buy it every day. We didn't worry so much about trying to change the system because that's an old thought. The, the system is gonna have to change itself. It doesn't have a choice because it no longer has the resources to sustain itself. So thank you very much uh, for your time. And thank you so much to the team. It was like, food is super complex. I'm just gonna throw that out. I know all your stuff is complex, but yeah. If you don't eat food, you die. So I'm just going to say that. <laughs>
and media to solve some of the problems because the problem does not rest with government, it rests with everyone because government is of the people, for the people. So what we do and how we do it is going to certainly um, create opportunities and help us to address the many challenges that exist uh, in our global world. The end of the charrette with all of the participants, it was kind of anticlimactic, I thought. You know, I think that there's always like this feeling of the, that you could have done more at the end of it. And there's also this feeling of elation and satisfaction that you've accomplished this kind of very complex project and, and thinking in such a short time frame. You know, I thought the results were, were really interesting and I thought that there was a lot of great kind of questions that they pose to, to future designers, but I still do. I think that there's a lot of flaws that need to be filled. The, the problem is that we all think alike. <laughs> I know, it's not a problem. Maybe it's a good sign. Maybe it's like, okay, we are like, as a collective of creative people, we are thinking a good direction all together. And maybe this is a signal that we can build something better for the world in the future together. Like, okay, we're all seeing the same kind of problems and the same bad situation, so let's go. And maybe we, we are a little, I don't know, we are, nothing surprises us anymore. Living in a difficult environment is good to strengthen yourself, basically. It's, uh, it's very sad, but competition is uh, something also disrupting, you know, and the distraction, the creative distraction of one of the most important economies, that is Schumpeter, is a real thing. I think designers need to learn a lot more about the world. Because if you spend four years becoming a craftsperson, you don't really know about economics, about politics, about people about psychology and sociology and anthropology and how people interact with technology and the role this plays in society. The critical thing for designers to do is to recognize people who are not designers don't understand the choices that a designer has. And that those choices implicate really important values, um, values which society collectively ought to be deciding whether it wants to protect or inhibit. I try to always think that there is these little, you know, initiatives that will stay strong and stay, you know, resi resilient and say, no, we are going to be the small, small niche markets or small, you know, initiatives that will really remind people of how it is that we could live. We're going to be poor or weak compared to the big power, and we already are, unfortunately. But I think we should never stop trying. That's why I'm here, actually. So when the IWB started, I attended with a group of people to see it. And it was the first time that I saw how could design find a doorway into the systems to fix them. And it was very inspirational to kind of change what I wanted to do with my discipline, which is architecture. Because architecture in many ways is off the moment. And so you have a very small window of time to try to affect change and that change has to be built into the buildings. You know, architects in the 20th century, they used to think they had the solution. They had the solution for everything. I think, you know, today we've learned that we shouldn't behave that way. Today we've learned that actually we have to engage people in that process. As architects, we can make, a, we can throw their ideas there, we can make urban demos, we can make designs. But actually the important thing is then to see how people will take our things and use them. Uh, the important thing is to see really how the population responds. It's a very different approach. It's almost like a collective way to transform the present and shape our future. Creo que puedo contribuir como diseñadora en los procesos de realización de ciertas cosas, en de cómo piensa un diseñador, enseñarles a las personas cómo llevar adelante un proceso, una idea, en realizar lo que se quiera realizar. Solo necesitamos aportar buenas ideas, tratar de trabajar en grupo, compartir con otra gente. De, de otras partes del mundo, otras ideas. 
tenemos que tratar de realizar eso, o sea, tratar de realizar lo que es imposible. The way you have to explain it to companies one at a time is by doing something, often a small project, that makes them wake up and say, oh, that was rather interesting. You start small with basically demonstration projects and you then expand from there and there and there. But how do we explain this to the world? I think we're in the, uh, I would say we're on the cusp of living, of truly living in a global village. To have a true global village, then you need to let down boundaries that you've created so that certain people can be more privileged than other people. And so are you willing to let go of those privileges that you have so other people can share in them? So there are a lot of barriers to overcome that are social barriers or ways of rethinking how we live and how we treat others, right? The charrette really pointed, the process of the charrette pointed to the problems that we have. How do we understand each other when we're culturally different? How do we accept each other and our differences? The beautiful thing about the charrette is by the end of it, people were doing that. People were really becoming in sync with each other because they had co-created something together. And I think that's actually the biggest thing that we have to overcome. If we're all creating our future separately and without dialogue and engagement with others, then we actually can't have a common future. Without answers to these questions, we won't be able to have a global village. So what's the answers to those questions? I don't think there's a simple answer right now. I think we have to work together to find them. If I had to sum it up, in my mind, it would be to move away from an either-or way of thinking to a both-and way of thinking. In either-or thinking, you're forced to take a position and be one thing or another. In a both-and way of thinking, you can be more than one thing. You can be part of something bigger, and yet you can be yourself. You can actually live in the world of gray much better than living in a world of just black and white.
Thank <laughs> you. 